In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar. Another week in lockdown, this is Cotswold District Council Live. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Cotswold District Council Live. I'm Councillor Joe Harris, and I'm the leader of Cotswold District Council and your host today. I'm joined in the studio today by Councillor Andrew Doherty, who is the Cabinet Member for Waste and Recycling. And today's, um, today's episode is going to be all about waste and recycling, talking about uh, all the different um, containers, what to put in them, and also 
a very special announcement on the garden waste service that I know many of you have been writing to us about. We're also going to be joined today by Amanda Howard from Cotswold Friends, um, who are a voluntary group in the North Cotswolds. We'll be hearing from her about what that group are up to um, during the lockdown. We're also going to be speaking to Paul Robertson. Paul is one of um, our employees um, at Cotswold District Council, and he and his family have undertaken a very special fundraising event for a local charity. So we'll be hearing from them later. First of all, before we begin, um, as I always do, a massive thank you to the Barn Theatre here in Sirencester for hosting us today. Uh, the way that they have adapted their operation uh, to cope with lockdown and really reinvent themselves has been quite inspirational. And it's absolutely fantastic that groups such as the Council and other organisations are able to use the facilities here to get across key messages to the community. If you're not familiar with the Barn, make sure you check out their website. Um, their social media and view everything that they've got to offer a really varied um, assortment um, and of course a massive thank you a massive massive thank you to all of our NHS staff to local key workers and to council staff for everything that they've been doing to ensure that services continue to function and that lives are saved so we're going to split today um, into a number of segments I'm going to hand over in a second to Councillor Andrew Doherty um, who's going to talk about, um, talk about waste. Um, he's going to be going through um, everything that we've got um, in the studio today. It's very exciting. Lots of props today. Um, and, and then we'll go to a couple of our, um, our video pieces, and then we will go to a live Q&A. So um, we're going to break it up a bit for you today, but make sure that you're commenting, make sure that you're posting your comments on social media. They will pop up on my screen, um, and we will take any questions um, that you put to, to us today. So Andy, over to you. Yeah, thanks Joe. Um, so we're going to attempt to do a live sort for some recycling and materials today and that's partly because one of the problems we're having at the minute is we're still getting between 100 and 200 or so people a day and not necessarily getting their containers right. Um, it's surprisingly time consuming on the paperwork for the teams are actually out on the vehicles and obviously it's inconvenient for those residents because then we're not picking up those containers. And it's particularly things like the black boxes and sorting out glass and paper and those kind of items. So we're going to run through and talk about those. Um, there's also an update in terms of where we are with the garden waste service. If I start with kind of a description of where we are with the service at the minute, we've said many times we've got higher volumes than normal. We're still running at that kind of Christmas level. Where we've got about a fifth more each day coming through the system. And that causes a lot of problems for us in terms of getting everything into the lorries. So one of the exercises we thought we'd go through today is how best you can help us with things like loading up plastic, with things like loading up paper, such that we can actually get everything into the vehicles. If we can get everything to the vehicles all of the time, it lets us run the full service and it means less disruption and less interruptions for you. The other problem that some of you are experiencing are repeated missed collections. And it's not a huge number of people who are experiencing that, but if you are one of them, it is very, very annoying to have your waste missed multiple times. And that's an area where we've been putting a team onto that to specifically deal with that and try and pick up and understand why we're missing them. Usually it's difficult locations, it's particularly rural things. As we talked about before, we've got at the minute about 18, 20% of our staff who would normally be with us are not available to us. So we've got a lot of temporary staff in, temporary drivers, temporary loaders, and they don't necessarily know where everything is. If you have a look at the map of the Cotswolds, we're about 450 square miles, but there's only 90,000 people in that 450 square miles. For comparison, Cheltenham is 120,000 people in just 18 square miles. So for example, where we use five vehicles to get round the district and do garden waste, they can do just three because there's so much less traveling distance for them. It takes our crews, for example, an hour just to drive from their depot up to somewhere like Mickleton before they even start doing any work. And then obviously at the end of their driving day, it's an hour to get back again, plus whatever time for moving materials from place to place. So one of the exercises we thought we'd do is go through how to run it a little more efficiently. Why do we do that? This is something we talked about with the service before in terms of why we arrange it the way we do. You do very well on recycling because of the way we get you to do the sorting. And the best way of thinking about that is if everybody in the district and every house is spending five minutes sorting out their waste every two weeks, that's the equivalent of somebody doing it on an eight hour day for 15 months nonstop. 
that's how much sorting you can do every two weeks for us. And by making best use of that, we can get more on the vehicles and we can get the best possible recycle it and the best quality recycling going off to be used again afterwards. Okay, so we're going to do a prop exercise. This is a, this is a first, isn't it? So, <laughs> so everybody that's watching, I'd ask you to, to bear with us. This is a barn theatre first, and we've got props, and Andy is going to give us a bit of a, um, a, bit of a tour of the various boxes, bags, etc., what they do. So, Andy... Uh, so this is very is, impressive. All of this came in your car. and it's, and it's Yeah, my car is not designed for this kind of stuff. <laughs> so this is very much a what's the worst that could happen type of exercise. So if we just pick up with some thing, simple things and start to go through them. So I'm going to assume the camera's following me about so you can see what I'm doing. Look at that. So we have got your usual collection of containers that hopefully almost all of you have got by now. We put a lot of effort into trying to catch up on containers that hadn't been delivered to people. So, for example, now the crews who do the deliveries of things like the bags, if you hadn't got one, are down to only about a week's waiting list from you ordering it. We are, when you've talked to customer service about bags, for example, asking people not to, for example, attempt to collect four or five of these. If everybody has loads of these, we can't get everything in the lorries, things start to fall apart again. So the reasons why we give you a certain set of containers is because that's what we know we can fit on the vehicles and we can get moved around across the district. So you've got your white bag, your blue cardboard bag, you should have two boxes, one for paper, one for glass. It may have been the wrong way around. No, that was the right way around. You've got your food waste caddy. You've got your, I didn't bring a whole one. You've got your wheelie bin for your residual waste. Um, you've also got, hopefully, a lot of you by now, things like your home composting setup. The one that's not on there at the minute that you will have seen we haven't talked about yet though is garden waste service and that's because one of the things to talk about today is that we're bringing the garden waste service back on stream from next week so we'll talk about what we'd like you to do to help us manage that, how we keep the volumes under control and how we assure we're picking up safely from as many people as possible as we go through that. So, if I take a few kind of typical items you're going to find at home, your classic cake, okay, something like this, standard plastic bottle, standard plastic bottles. We used to, for example, which is a point of confusion for people, ask you to take the lids off. Bizarrely, these days, we ask you to keep the lids on, squash it up as much as you can, it's smaller, and then that's going in your white bag for your plastics. Andy, I've learned something already because I, I didn't know that you asked us to take the cap off. You know. We used to ask That's... you to take the cap off, and now we don't. How long okay. have we done that for? <laughs> uh, we've been actually oh, yeah. asking you to keep the cap on for about two or three years, I think. There we go. So I've been before a my for time. Eight years, and that's the first I've heard. Yeah. There we go. Marvellous. And that's just because behind the scenes, the machines that sort this stuff change, and what they do now is they smash the whole thing to bits, and the lids come off anyway, so they get sorted out. What our crews um, at the recycling centre, for example, are having trouble with is if you took them off, they tended to fall through gaps in the machinery. So they ended up with big heaps of lids and stuff left around in places. So, plastic bottles, lots of plastic bottles. Okay, obviously everybody trying to avoid single-use bottles as much as possible these days. You've also got things like your cans. Same logic with cans. The more you can squash it, the easier it is for us. And that's taking up less room. The stuff that goes into the white bag, for example, like this, is usually fairly squashable and fairly light. So the thing you have on the lorries for us, for example, is it doesn't take much weight before it's full. So the more you can squash those things down, the easier you make it for us. Andy, on the, on the cans, now there, there has been some confusion because a couple of years ago, they used to go in the black box, didn't they? And I know some people still put them in the black box, but just so we're clear, tins and cans should go in the white bag. Yeah, and here's one of the things I probably shouldn't show you, but I will anyway. One of our problems is, historically, we had um, bags that were telling you not to actually put tins in here. Unfortunately, that advice on the old bags is wrong. The new bags are about to be printed and will be distributed to people. So the advice is always look on the website, and on the website will be the latest and most accurate description of what you should put where. So you can generally pay attention to things like your new blue cardboard bag, because it's nice and shiny and new, and it's got up-to-date instructions. If you've got something like one of the older white bags, what's on there may not be quite right, so watch out for what it says on the website. You've all got your little guides on the back of the calendars, you've got the other materials that came out to most people in February about how we needed to sort things. 
One area where we're having a spot of bother at the minute are things like this, paper recycling materials. Um, there's a couple of particular parts of the district that seem to be producing more of it than anyone else, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. And what we're having particular problems with is people taking this, which is your classic thing that comes out your Amazon bag, and then just doing that with it when they put it into the paper. What we actually want you to do is to take these kinds of things and just fold them up a bit more. Flatten them so they take hardly any space by comparison. Now the reason why that's important when we're actually running through the service is paper is one of the things that we don't compact on the lorries. So whatever you put into the lorry stays like that. It shuffles about a bit as we drive around, but it doesn't get squashed down. And what we found, for example, one day a couple of weeks ago, is that everybody to start with on a round had done nice flat paper, and everybody at the end then had done scrunched up paper. And there was nothing to squash it. That vehicle fills up. It has to stop collecting paper. We're then back the following day to collect it, which takes time where we could be doing the collections we're scheduled to do on each day. So wherever you've got material like this, and this is the classic stuff that's coming through at the minute for things like home shopping. There's lots of you doing home shopping at the minute. We can see all that because of the sheer amount of cardboard you're generating. Take them, squash them, flatten them out in the bag. You've got your usual envelopes and all these kinds of things. And um, these I've taken from home. So the family, for example, are very well behaved. They're even ripping out the little plastic envelopes there. So we've just got paper. So that's the best quality kind of paper material that goes through. And this, if it's good quality material, is pretty much guaranteed to be reused for something useful. One important point that the crews wanted me to talk about when it comes to paper oh. is something they're having a spot of bother with at the minute, which is, I can make, assume noisy noise of someone blowing their nose going on now. <laughs> this does not happen, okay? That's a no-no. So anything you've got, paper, for example, that you've used, obviously if you've got a house where anyone is potentially symptomatic, you should be bagging that and keeping it in a separate bag for 72 hours. That's the advice from Public Health England before you even put it out with the rest of the waste. So Andy, can I just, so yeah. people are... <laughs> people are putting used tissues people in People are putting the used tissues yeah. in the recycling. Yeah. The, this makes the crews quite unhappy, as you can well, I'm imagine. I'm not surprised. Can I, yeah, just a plea to... Um, I, thought, I would have thought that would have been common sense, but... Just a plea, please don't put used tissues, whether you think you've got the coronavirus or not, um, either now or at any point in the future. It's unhygienic and it's just a bit nasty. So please don't put um, used tissues in the recycling. Yeah. Put them in the main bin. Uh, tissues are a good one, for example. Normally you can put them in with one of the food or green wastes if you need to put them somewhere. But as I said, ideally, if they are actual snotty tissue territory, then that's the kind of stuff you want to be putting in the residual waste in your black bag. So if you pick out a few more items and just go through where things go, you've got tricky little bits of things like this. So it's plastic, it's scrunchy foam. It's not rigid plastics, which is one of the things you'll see talked about on the white container. So we don't have anywhere this can go. This doesn't get recycled at the minute. So this kind of thing ends up going in your residual waste, unfortunately. But that's the nature of what we can and can't recycle at the minute and what things there is and isn't to market for them to be reused. So in here I've got more plastic bottles. So again, same thing. Squash it, scrunch it. Most people are having quite a lot of plastic bottles. So it's probably a bit noisy. And obviously, with the weather having been reasonably good at the minute, people are getting through a lot of cans, plastic bottles, all those kinds of things, uh, where they're out if they're able to enjoy in their gardens and so on and so forth. Um, we're all getting through quite a lot of this kind of stuff at the minute, for example. Um, again, some parts of the district are getting through considerably more than others, but I won't bring attention to which ones those are. So, so Andy, I, you don't drink an awful lot, so I'm guessing that that is Mrs Doherty's bottle of gin? I can possibly comment, but gin is one of the few things I do actually drink. <laughs> to be fair, it takes us quite a long while to get through our collection. So, this is one of the bits that's um, changed in terms of what we're talking about and asking people what to do now. So I've got one of the black boxes, you're doing paper. I've got one of the black boxes, you are doing glass. And that's the only thing that's going in that one. So I've got all sorts of odds and sods of other glass containers. They're all going in there. 
One thing I am doing when I do that is that I'm doing that carefully. One of the other problems that the guys are having on the cruise is people doing things like broken glass going into containers. When they tip it, things like broken glass will tend to bounce off things and go everywhere. Um, we had someone last year who had a couple of weeks off work because a piece of broken glass bounced off and hit them in the eye again. If the crews see broken glass, they won't take that container. We've also had problems, for example, with people doing things like putting broken glass in here. This obviously is not a rigid bag. We're not expecting to have anything sharp and unpleasant inside it. So that's also a definite no-no. If you've got something like broken glass, absolute best thing to do is to wrap it up in newspaper or some other kind of paper fairly thoroughly and then put it in your black bin waste. It's safe, it's out of the way, no one's going to try and do any manual handling on it, it'll be left alone and it won't cause any problems for anybody. So I've got other bits in here in terms of cardboard. Okay, good example, what we're looking for, nice, flattened, tidy cardboard, goes in your bag, a uh, constant source of arguments with my wife and I is whether it goes flat down or facing up. Crews aren't particularly bothered. We've just both agreed to disagree that we've got the best way of doing it. <laughs> so I've got all sorts of bit of cardboard. And the key thing about all of this is it's all flattened out. So if I flatten it out and I put it in there, the other thing it's going to enable you to do is to just get more in there. So you can get more in the container that you've got. And then we can get more of that through into the lorries. So on the lorries, for example, the cardboard that goes in there, there's then a compaction mechanism on it. And one of the oddities we've had in April, for example, is that cardboard doesn't actually squash very well when it's really dry. And April has been really dry, so that's made it hard to get as much cardboard in. So one of the things we quite look forward to sometimes is having a bit more rain so that we know that this stuff actually gets wet. We're also working on adjusting the lorries at the minute, for example, to bump up the amount of compaction they do a bit so we can try and get some more material in. But if we do that with the lorries as they are, we run the risk of blowing the doors off the back. So there's actual welding and mechanical work being done to the vehicles to let us increase that pressure and squash that cardboard some more. Andy, just while you're there, we've had a couple of questions coming through live, and we're getting quite a few, actually. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pose a couple of you yep. to you very quickly, um, just some of the, the most relevant. Um, a couple of questions about metal screw tops on glass bottles. Um, what do you want us to do with those? Um, they, metal is fairly easy to sort out. So whether they end up with kind of tin and can territory like this, or whether they end up in the glass, there's a nice straightforward magnetic mechanism that will pull all of those out. Okay. So if you've got screw tops, for example, on glass bottles going in, that's fine for them to go in with it. Similarly, if you want to put them in with the tins and cans, that's also fine. Okay, uh, another question. We noticed um, that you're not removing bottle labels. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, that's all right for the service that we run. It does vary a bit, and different authorities do slightly different things, but we don't ask you to do that necessarily for our purposes. If you can, it does help, because quite often they're made from different materials to the actual bottle. Um, but again, it's, you're probably getting into a bit small print in terms of looking at the specifics of what you could do. Thank you, Dougie. I'm sure you'll come on to Tetra Packs in a minute. Yep. I've got a couple of questions for that, so I'll let you continue. Um, OK, I, this, I'm trying not to take all day with this. Right. <laughs> So this is not mine, but this is one from home. Oh, yeah. So this is a good example, again, of the kind of stuff you get and what's actually in here. So this box has got all sorts of materials inside it. So I've got some bits that are cardboard that have got ripped off the top, so I'm about to do the wrong thing. Um, and then these, for example, are scrunched up paper. So again, same thing. If you can try and keep them flat to go in, and then whatever's left of the box best thing to do that is there's usually a couple of joints somewhere on the box, pull those apart and then the box breaks down into something a bit flatter, a bit easier to go in the box. Same thing for things like the kind of your classic can boxes, just got a couple of bits on the back and the front, pull them and then the whole thing will squash and rip apart a bit more easily. I won't run through all of them because I guess that will probably take too long. So, same kind of thing, scrunched up paper, try and fold it down. If it's folded down so it's a bit flatter, it's going to take up less room. A bit more paper, again, cardboard I could break up. We've then got a few things which fall into the slightly tricky pile. And we've talked about some of these kinds of things at Christmas, for example. So, we've got our old favourite, and I have actually saved this from Christmas. Things like very metalised paper. You see the thing about that, I scrunch it, and it doesn't matter how hard I scrunch it, it pops back out and starts to go back to shape again. 
So this kind of stuff is not really paper. And this ends up going in the residual waste because it's neither one thing nor another. So if you want to avoid, for example, wrapping paper with plastics in it, just use the plainest paper you can get, and then you'll be able to put it in with the paper recycling. You've got things like fruit tubs, nice, straightforward plastic. If you're going for containers with things in, absolute best thing to try and go for all the time is clear plastic. It's the most useful from the manufacturers, it has the highest value in terms of being used in the rest of the plastics recycling industry. So they're really keen on things like clear plastic. That's good to go in. You've got things like cardboard boxes. Same thing again. The trouble with stuff like this is you've got all these bits of plastic like that. Get the cardboard out. And then the unfortunate thing is, for example, this kind of plastic, there are specialist recyclers and reprocessors for it. I know a lot of you are quite keen on recycling. Look at things like uh, TerraCycle, who do various different types of specialist plastics recycling. But unfortunately, this, again, is the kind of thing that, for us, ends up with the residual waste. Uh, and last, probably, thing in terms of here, you've also got things like black plastics, constant source of confusion, Black plastics we do take, so black and brown plastics. The trouble with them in the market at the minute still is they tend to be still quite hard to sort. But we tend to sort out black and brown plastics away from everything else, and then they'll get used for relatively low-grade plastic items. So things like benches, garden furniture, that kind of stuff. You're a bit less fussy about the colours, you're a bit less fussy about the finish, and it can take a bit more of a mix of plastics. Um, and there are also things like this. This is effectively made out of the same things as bottles are. So that is, if you can see, fairly rigid in terms of what in there. So that kind of rigid material can go in. You've then got a personal favourite of mine, slightly more complicated products. So, for example, this has got a couple of cardboard bits and then an inner plastic bit. So what we're after you to do is to separate out the plastic bits from the cardboard bits and then try and keep things flat again. Right, I think that's kind of the stuff I'll go through on the box. We've now got a pop quiz exercise for the leader of the council. Oh, God. <laughs> to run through what goes where. So, so that, that's a cooked chicken. Uh, so what you want me to tell you? you want where does me to that tell go? You? Oh, so that, if it's cooked, it would go in the food caddy. The, okay, okay, very good. Yeah, that's a good start. Right, fairly obviously, you should not be throwing away whole cooked chickens. So what we're talking about here is what's left over in terms of things like cooked meat products. So ideally, all you'd have left from this is a carcass, and you've even used the carcass to make soup and all the other good stuff, so you've got maximum use out of that. That's then going in your food caddy. Andy, do, do you just want to lift that thing. bin up so that yep. um, everyone can just... So you should all have one of these. If you haven't, please do get in touch. They were, it's part of the new waste service that we rolled out, in interestingly, when the lockdown began. Um, but yeah, if you haven't got one of those, get in touch and we'll get one to you ASAP. That's your new food caddy. Okay, timing not ideal. And these ones, for example, you should be hopefully used to them by now. They've got a proper locking catch on them. And that's obviously to keep out particularly things like foxes and other kind of vermin you might get in coming around and doing stuff and trying to get to what's inside there. So that clips neatly. That's the one we're picking up every week, week in, week out, in terms of trying to collect food from you. So something slightly different. I assume it's a, le a leftover lettuce, okay. leaves. So that's a le leftover lettuce. Um, I, <laughs> God, I I'm feeling the pressure here. I would probably put that straight into the food caddy, but I bet you're going to say that you can put it in your green bin or a composter. Okay, that is yeah. what I'm going to say. Okay, cool, there we go. So, again, it's uncooked, it's raw foodstuffs that's coming through from the kitchen, often coming out of the garden in the first place. If you compost yourself, then the best thing to do with this kind of material is for it to go into your own compost bin. Um, the compost bin, obviously a lot of people have grass all the time. We'll talk about that in a minute. So it's good to have other things to mix in there. Helps you get a better compost as you go through. Right, try and speed up with these a bit. Okay, now we're talking bread. Um, right, can you put it in the composter? I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, no, you can't. <laughs> God, look, I'll tell you what. I didn't, tell you, when I became the leader a year ago, I didn't think I'd be being quizzed on the... Right, okay, um, food caddy then. Go. Well, I didn't think I'd learn about all this stuff either. But um, so, that one, wouldn't recommend that. Okay. What you're best off doing is having that one as another food caddy. Again, because what that is, is that's a processed food, fairly high in calories, popular with things that might try and get into your bin. 
I do have, I know quite a lot of people who do things like um, allotments, and they actually put quite a lot of stuff in because they do composting on a really large scale, and they get through it quickly, and it breaks down really quickly. I tell you what, I bet bin day in your household. Do you, do you make your family do all of this every week? Uh, huh? Sometimes. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, okay, so, collection of citrus fruits. Oh, I'm going to say the food caddy, but you're going to say you can put it in the compost, aren't you? Right, actually, you're right first time. Okay, right, cool. So, citrus fruit, okay. not recommended for composting. Citrusy stuff doesn't tend to work well in there. So, best for that thing for that, in the food caddy, off to the anaerobic digestion plant, feed the bacteria, produce gas for things. Right, I think that can go in the composter, can't okay. it? OK, potato peelings, not cooked, raw vegetable stuff. So if you've got a compost heap, that can go in the compost heap. I'm going to do an example of you don't have a compost heap, so you're going to put it in with your food waste, because that's actually what it is, it's just uncooked. Um, right, cheese, bread and cheese, we're on my street now. Right, OK, that's dairy, so... Would you want to put that in your compost bin? I think probably not. No, well, uh, what are your Tom and Jerry's of the world particularly like? Cheese? Oh, rats. So yeah. wouldn't do that one in terms of kind of vermin stuff. So again, best thing to do with that one, probably even if you've got a compost heap, is likely to go for that. Uh, right, I'm going to leave that one because we've had <laughs> enough of those. <laughs> OK, right, flowers. Okay. We'll see the flowers. Yeah, Mum gets through enough of these, so... Um, we even put them in our garden waste bin. Is this where you're going to tell me that we're wrong? We should. Uh, no, I could go in the garden. I could go in the garden bin. waste. There you go. I could Mom. go in the garden waste you bin. Are. You could also, if you want you're to, off though, the hook. compost it because okay. you've got a few stalks and stems and stuff in there. It helps to break it up. Uh, right, everybody's favourite food product. Oh, I love chips. Okay, um, food caddy. Okay. No, it's potato. Potato. So could it go in the, or is it because it cooked? Cooked. Same cooked. thing. You got fat. You got all sorts of oh. stuff going on in there. So that's going in the food caddy. Nearly at the end. Apple. Okay, that should be off to go in the composter, yeah? Yeah, so obvious one, that can go into the composting. But if you're not composting necessarily, they'll encourage you to do so. That could go in your food caddy. <laughs> right, last thing is big piles of... What's that? I can't see. Um, we that? can't zoom in on that, can we? Uh, oh, it's grass, right, grass. okay. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I've had many, many conversations over the last few weeks with people about grass. So this is definitely one of the ones you come around to composting. It's not going anywhere else. Or, if you're not able to compost, if you've got too much material, that's the kind of stuff that's going in your garden waste bin. One of the things we're asking people to do, though, is on the garden waste service, the plan for the garden waste service is for that to restart next week, and it will restart from Wednesday using the schedule we would normally have for collections. So if you look on your calendar and you look to see which day we'd normally be collecting garden waste, from Wednesday next week onwards, that's when we're going to aim to collect it. So, obvious kind of couple, couple of questions on that. Why are we not collecting all of it and doing the entire backlog in one go? Fairly simple. We've got 45,000 houses to collect waste from normally, so that's everybody. We've got 22,000 houses to do garden waste from, so that's a bit less than half of people. I can't get enough lorries to go around 22,000 houses all in one go. If you look at the way we have our service arranged, we've got five lorries normally out doing garden waste. They're basically running over a 10-day cycle. So every day, they're only able to pick up about 2,200 houses. So it's about 440 each that they're picking up each day. So if you do the maths, you can work out how many extra lorries I would need immediately to try and pick up everything. So we're doing a few things on this. One is to encourage you to keep composting. The carbon footprint of composting at home is better than has having it in a diesel lorry and driving around the district. The other one that's come out at a useful time is to encourage, I'll come a bit closer with that, as many people as possible to take life part in Plant Life UK's No Mo May, which is the Twitter um, tag they've got for it. And that's exactly what it says on the tin. They're asking people not to mow their lawns in May. And the reason for that is what you'll start to get is you'll start to get a lot of native flowers. Wild flowers, other people may call them weeds, depending on how you look at it, will start to come up in the lawn. And that's fantastically good for native pollinators who are under threat at the minute and in long-term decline. And what they're looking for you to do is ideally mow as little of your lawn as possible and leave it all the way through May 
So at the end of the month, you can look to see how many flowers you've got, and you can provide them with that and report it to their website and give them an idea of how much difference that makes and how many extra insects that helps to do. Andy, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a break because you have been speaking very impressively for nearly half an hour. Um, so what I'm going to do now, um, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, we had a video piece and a Q&A with Daisy Payne, who is a vlogger based here in the Cotswolds and has a vlog about um, her garden and some of the some of the small things that she's doing in her in, in her garden. So what we're going to do, we've got a pre-recorded video uh, and it's all about composting. So very apt. Um, we're going to run the VT. Chris, do the honours. Hello, I'm Daisy from Garden to Garnish on Instagram and YouTube and I'm here today to show you my recent delivery. Um, this is my new home composting bin and I've been thinking about ordering one of these for a while but the pausing of the green bin collection was just the nudge I needed to uh, get online and order one. In this really short video I'm just going to show you uh, how I'm going to get started and hopefully it'll inspire you to get involved too. So my compost bin was really easy to order online and it came uh, within two weeks actually so that's pretty speedy. It did say it would take up to 28 days. Um, I've got a base plate here um, so hopefully that will give it the aeration it needs uh, while also keeping it nice and warm. I've popped it at the top of the garden and that is because it gets a lovely bit of morning sun that will help to heat it all up inside, which gets the composting process going. Now my green bin is really full and it's very heavy. So I'm gonna start the job, the very messy job I have to say, of taking out what we can and then loading it in to the compost. Now I've been doing a bit of research and composting essentially means you need to balance brown and green items. And the green items are things like grass cuttings, soft prunings, annuals, old vegetable and fruit scraps, old cut flowers, and you can put some tea bags in and coffee grounds are good too. Brown materials that can go in are things like cardboard torn up, newspaper again torn up, um, and things like straw and scrunched up paper. And things that you definitely do not want to put in are any diseased plants, any meat or fish, dairy, or even cooked food, that is a big no-no. Also, you might be tempted to put things like ash um, or cat and dog glitter, um, but absolutely do not put those in. Um, and also a big no-no to perennial weeds, um, and one example of that would be bindweed. So there we go, hopefully that's inspired you to get online and get your own composting bin ordered. Good luck. And that concludes this week's bin update. Sorry, the guys at the Barn Theatre made that for me, and we think it's a bit over the top, but it is quite funny, and they've been desperate to play it, and they're all sat behind giggling, so um, that, that was for them. Bit of fun. Um, thank you, thank you, Daisy. Um, Daisy was hoping to join us today um, to answer some of your questions, but unfortunately cannot make it, but we will make sure that we get her back um, in the next few weeks, and you can ask um, any questions you have of her. On that theme, then, let's ask some questions of um, Andy. Andy, we've had quite a few questions, um, quite a few um, of the same questions. So what we'll do, we'll, I'll, I'll go through some of them. Um, James Partridge, textiles, question mark. Uh, OK, so I didn't have absolutely everything. So there's two things I didn't show you in here. One is textiles, one is we products, as they're known, which is basically waste electricals and electronics. So if you have a look at the instructions we've supplied for both of those, what you're looking to do for textiles is to put them inside a bag, preferably on top of everything else in one of the black boxes. We had, for example, a problem two weeks ago where something actually caught fire at the recycling centre. Not seriously, but enough to be a concern because someone had hidden a piece of electric equipment inside the paper and that paper is bailed and crushed. And at that point, the battery inside it was squashed and started to overheat. So what we need you to do is take your electricals, put them in a bag, put them on top where the crews can clearly see it, and do the same with your textiles. What they'll then do is when they pop the lid off of that black recycling box, they'll put those in another container on the vehicle, so they're away and they're in the right places, and then they'll tip whatever else is left in that container, be it glass or paper, into the vehicle. Okay, uh, 
Claire Gardner, you haven't mentioned aerosols. Do they go in the white bag? Aerosols do go in the white bag. Exactly right. Okie dokie. Um, can the CDC provide compost bins for the garden? That's from Emma Graham. So we don't provide compost bins ourselves, but if you go through um, the Gloucestershire Recycles website, you'll see a link there to a supplier of composting bins. And I, I think, in fact, that's actually where Daisy got her bin from, for example. And those bins, for example, are discounted through Gloucestershire, which is the authority that has to dispose of the waste for the whole of Gloucestershire. And you can get one of those, order it. I think they have been quite busy, as obviously there were various garden waste suspensions, not just here, but in some surrounding authorities and generally across the country. But I think stocks are generally in now and it's one to two weeks to get most things delivered so you can get up and running with it yourself. OK, uh, I've got one here from uh, Pamela Hayden. Um, I know you like the cardboard flattened, but I have rheumatoid arthritis and cannot easily do this. Uh, will my cardboard still be taken if I don't flatten it? Um, yeah, we won't take the cardboard just because it's not flattened. It just helps us. So it's a so classic kind of thing. If most people do that, it makes a big difference to the service. Obviously, if you're not able to, we're not forcing you to do something you're not able to do. And for example, particularly if you're someone who has an assisted collection, so you're not able to get your containers out and we come and collect them, that's the kind of thing where we're not expecting you're necessarily going to be able to do all of these things and we will still take that material. What we're looking to avoid is where people build a towering pile of cardboard, kind of three metres tall, going up into the stratosphere, because that's the kind of stuff that's too much material and really hard for us to get into the lorries. OK, um, we have got um, Elizabeth Pollitt. Um, can you still use the old cardboard recycling bags? Um, you can use the old cardboard recycling bags, but you will find that they are being removed um, as we go through the process, basically because the system is sized to have one of those cardboard bags per household. So if everyone starts trying to collect more and more containers to put the cardboard in, we have the problem of not filling it in the lorry, that service fails, we don't pick everything up, we have to come back the following day. And as again, as I said, in terms of if you think about the travel times, all of our lorries are always coming from a depot just south of South Cerny. So, for example, to go up to the north of the district, it's an hour's drive. It's half an hour's drive to get down to the south of the district. That travel time is a killer for the service. So we need to do things to try and avoid having un any unnecessary travel not being in there. OK, uh, i got one here from Bryony Holden. Um, can the crews respect our bins and not throw them on the floor and all over the path? My garden and food bins are clean inside and out, but the chaps have often emptied, neighbor, um, have often empty, uh, emptied my neighbour's slops into them before taking them onto the cart. Um, I then have the distasteful job of recleaning my bin. Um, so we should be packing... There is a specific diagram for the crews of how to arrange the bins and put them back together again to put them at the side. So if we're not doing that, report that, we can look at which crew's doing it. The key thing with those kinds of things is all of our new vehicles have cameras on board. So if you're having an actual problem, we can track down and see what it looked like and what was acceptable and what is not acceptable. And then we can feed back to the crews on what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong. OK. Um, have I missed... Uh, this is Amanda Tibbins. Have I missed uh, when the green bin um, is going to be collected? I've left mine outside the house for the last six weeks. Too heavy to move back and forth. OK, so the green bin collections, I think, as I said earlier, so we're aiming to restart them next Wednesday, and what, not tomorrow, a week Wednesday. And what that means in practice is that we'll start to go back to the fortnightly collection schedule that should have happened from uh, mid-March onwards, but obviously was suspended when we came into the COVID situation. So if you look and you look at your normal collection day, that will be the day that we will pick the garden waste up, along with your black bin, along with your dry recycling. But the key thing is that will not be before next Wednesday. If you are due your main collection next Wednesday, that's when we'll do it. If you are due your main collection the Thursday, that's when we'll do it. If you're due your main collection the Friday, that's when we'll do it. And we'll follow that process so that we can go through and systematically work through all of them over a two-week period couple of key messages to put out there. We cannot take extra side material. I know that that's inconvenient. I'm sorry about that. But it literally becomes a problem if we cannot get everything onto the lorry and we start to have the problems of it failing again. So what we're asking you to do is to keep your bin closed, to keep your bin as lid on as tight as you can get it. Please try not to have vast amounts of material sticking out of the top. If it's hard for the crews to get onto the lorry, they won't be able to empty it. So it's in your own interest to try and have it as manageable as possible. If you need to take a little bit of loose material out of the top of it so you can get the bin fairly well shut, 
do that and then put that back in after we emptied it and try and feed us that garden waste you might have which is excess in stages over the next few weeks and that's one of the reasons why we're recommending the no mow may as a choice because green waste is very often lawn clippings and grass cuttings if you try and cut down on those you'll have more room to get the rest of the excess in Okay, uh, right, we've got quite a few questions, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to fire through them, and um, Andy, I'm going to ask you to be as concise as you possibly <laughs> can be. Um, so you're invested in new equipment that does not squash items down. Oversight, question mark, and that's from Tim Phillips. Uh, I don't know which material we're talking about. All of the stuff that can be squashed is squashed. If you're talking about the paper, then no, you basically can't squash the paper because you're talking about a two-dimensional object in the first place. So that's not a thing you would normally squash. Okay, um, right. Uh, what have we got? Um, Mark Kelly, Tetra Packs, please, question mark. Yeah, Tetra Packs in the white bag along with your cans, your tins and your plastic bottles. Okie dokie. Um, Robert Attrell, I'm sure brown paper had to go in with the card, question mark. No, if it is paper, it goes in with paper. Okay, uh, we've got one here. Kay Ransom, um, is there anywhere we can take soft plastic? Now Tesco no longer takes it. Um, soft plastics is a bit difficult at the minute because I know TerraCycle's been having a bit of trouble with some of those services with the restrictions on at the minute. So I think the simple answer is if you really want to try and hang on to that for the moment until there's something resembling a bit more normality with collections and people like Tesco's and other services can get back going again. Okay. Um, we have got one here from um, Linda Hicks Collett. Uh, is it possible to get white goods collected? Um, yeah, we've never stopped doing um, bulky collections. So if you ring up and you order a bulky collection, those have still been happening. Those have never been suspended here. Okie dokie. Um, I've got a few about this, and I know it's not the District Council's um, facility, um, but this is around household recycling centres. The tip, um, when will Foss Cross be reopened? Um, simple answer is we don't know because um, we don't run it. We know that there is a lot of discussion going on at county council level about how to get the various household recycling centres back up and running again. Um, and I imagine they'll be publicising some details of that fairly soon. I know they have con practical concerns about somewhere like Foss Cross, just because it is an isolated site with a slightly tricky access road. And they're literally worried about huge queues and people getting stuck and all kinds of problems as they open that up. So what they're looking at at the minute is what's the best and safest way of opening that up so people can make use of it without causing additional issues for everyone. Okay, um, a few questions about this. Um, so as I understand it, there are no, technically there are no valid um, green bin licenses at the minute. When that service restarts, um, what's the situation gonna be? Okay, excellent question. So the way that will work is everyone's licenses that have already been paid for ran out on the 31st of March. We're going to extend those so they run up to the end of June, so an additional three months on top, and we will carry on collecting any 31st of March 2020 license up until the end of June. What we will then also do in parallel with that is we'll start to run up the renewals process for green waste, so we can start to process the renewals in June from the beginning of June onwards, and that will enable us to get new licenses out to everyone, so from July, you'll have new licenses on the bins, and at that point, we'll only start collecting those bins that have got up-to-date licenses. Okay, dokie. Right, we're going to, um, I'm going to allow Andy to have a bit of a, a, bit of a drink. Um, well done, Andy. Um, we're going to go now to our community champions section. Every week, we feature some, um, we feature a community and really hear from, hear from them what they've been up to. Um, today, I spoke to Cotswold Friends, who are a voluntary organisation in the North Cotswolds. I spoke to Amanda Howard, their CEO. I'm joined now by Amanda Howard, who is the Chief Executive of Cotswold Friends up in the North Cotswolds. Amanda, thank you for joining us today. Can you just give us a bit of an overview of what Cotswold Friends do? Cotswold Friends is a community charity that started in 1978, primarily to recruit volunteers for medical appointment transport. Since then, it's grown and now offers four services. So we have transport befriending, um, respite for carers and community activities. Community activities are quite varied, so it ranges from men in sheds to craft, knitting, walking sports like walking football, um, and lots of lunch clubs. Fantastic. And also, we've been in lockdown now for, for, for a couple of months. What I imagine you've been very busy during the past couple of months <laughs> with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, can you just tell us a bit about what you guys have been doing um, well, since, 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 um, since the lockdown began uh, towards the end of March? 
Cotswold Friends was in the fortunate position that it was set up for crisis management because we do have adverse weather conditions sometimes in the North Cotswolds, primarily um, rain and flooding and snow. So we were able very quickly to unplug our phones and unplug our laptops and all work from home. So all our client and volunteer data is held on a cloud-based contact management software system. So we had complete continuity of service, really. So we were supporting 2,000, just over 2,000 clients. These are mainly older and vulnerable people um, in the North Cotswolds community with about 400 volunteer roles filled. So that's about 340 actual volunteers. Um, of course, a lot of our volunteers um, were unable to continue to support um, out in the community um, because of isolating and lockdown. So we launched immediately telephone support services instead of face-to-face. -face. So instead of, for example, one-to-one -one befriending in a face-to-face -face environment, people phoned the people that they've been befriending. Some people have been befriending the same person for many years. So it was quite seamless transition for them. So that was quite helpful. Uh, of course, we've had new clients joining um, during this period, and that's been slightly harder to get people, people matched for telephone befriending. But it's worked so well because the community has been so helpful in coming forward to volunteer. So we've had over 150 new volunteers during this period, um, which has been great. And other than the community transport service, which has maintained it's still taking people for vital hospital appointments, although in a much reduced way. So previously we were taking about 200 people a week to their GP and hospital appointments. And last week, I believe it was something like 20 because hospitals have only been taken a, a very reduced number of people to see. Going forward, we're expecting that number to rise hugely as um, outpatients appointments begin again. Um, I think it's gonna be quite challenging for the transport service to meet that need. And we're also expecting clinics to start again very soon. People are beginning to get appointments through. So we've gone from 105 volunteer drivers to about 30 active volunteer drivers. So. And we're encouraging community members to please come forward <laughs> if you're able to drive for us because we desperately need more drivers at this time. Well, there you have it. There's the there's the call to arms challenge to uh, to everybody watching um, watching today. Um, Amanda, can you just sort of remind us of the area that you covered? I mentioned the North Cotswolds. What does that actually cover? Well, from Mickleton right right up in the north um, down to just underneath North Leach, um, around about the middle of the Cotswolds. So it's 65. It's five towns and 65 villages and hamlets, and quite a few isolated individual homes. It's a very rural community. Um, it's 33,000 people, over 11,000, so over a third of the population is past retirement age. So it's an older community. Um, the national average for retired people is about 18%, so they're about 33%, so it's significantly older. And it's an older part of Gloucestershire as well. It's an area that's in the lowest 10% in the accessibility ratings, which means it, it really is highly rural. So accessibility is about getting access to services like shops, pharmacies, post offices, schools, GPs. So we have a lot of lanes, not very many main roads and a lot of fields. It's a very beautiful area, but it's a very dispersed area. And the larger part of the population lives outside of the towns. So it really is a truly rural community. And what would you say, you, know, you mentioned you sort of need drivers and, you know, demand has gone up. What are, what are the biggest challenges that coronavirus has sort of presented? What do you, uh, what, what do you sort of... It was already an, an area that suffered through loneliness and isolation. So a lot of Cotswold Friends services are all about pe keeping people connected to community. Of course, with the lockdown, that's exacerbated the, pop the problem hugely. So it's been quite a lot of thought has gone into how we can keep people connected. So it isn't just that people have needed that telephone support. They've also need food, food shopping deliveries, pharmacy del deliveries, helping GP practice with dispensary deliveries, um, meals. We've had some of our amazing lunch clubs um, have stopped obviously providing um, the lunch club because the pubs are closed, but they've still been cooking the meals and we've been delivering them out um, into the community. So. It's a case of trying to find innovative ways to keep, keep people connected whilst on lockdown and support them for the vital services that they need. People still need food. People still need um, medicine. So um, the volunteers have really been remarkable in, in uh, helping us to achieve that. 
Amanda, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for joining us um, today. And I know you've been working with our officers at the District Council, so there's that link there. And hopefully, um, when we re return to some sort of normality, I hope we can hook up um, in the future and see what, see what else we can do to build on this new environment that coronavirus has, um, has sort of created, because um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of, a lot of new structures have, um, have sprung out. We've got lots of new volunteers, and let's try and make sure we can keep that going into the future. Amanda, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And if you, have, if you know of a community that you think should be featured and um, deserves a bit of praise, then please get in touch with me, um, either via the comments or email me, joe.harris at cotswold.gov.uk. We want to feature as many as possible and really celebrate the great work that is happening up and down the Cotswolds. Back to waste then. Um, Andy. We'll go through a few more questions, but I think first of all, you want to say something about fly tipping, because this is something that's um, been in the press quite a lot. Yeah, we've not suffered as heavily as some areas have in terms of fly tipping, but it's still a concern. Um, there's always a worry that we're not seeing all the fly tipping because obviously less of you are actually out and about at the minute and not necessarily reporting it. What we have seen is a bit of an uptick in some of the bil uh, bigger builder type fly tipping. And that's one of the things we've got a particular concern about. And we've talked about this, for example, on the television, for example, with people, about people taking care about how they're getting uh, their waste disposed of. There's an initiative you can find on our website, which is called Scrap. And the Scrap Fly Tipping Initiative is mostly about trying to get you to look at who is taking your waste away, what are they charging, where are they going, can they tell you a plausible story about where that material is going? Are they charging what seems like a reasonable rate? And most importantly, can they actually show you evidence they have, for example, a waste license? Someone who doesn't have a waste license cannot take away waste for you. It's a very clear rule. It is not legal for them to be doing that. So what we're asking householders to do is if you're having work done and people are taking that material away for you, please check that they've got the right licenses, that you know where that material is going, and take some responsibility for that waste, because at the end of the day, that waste is yours, regardless of where it ends up. It came out of your house and your property in the first place. OK. Um, I had a, I've had a question here via email, which doesn't always happen. Um, this is from Peter Durney. Dear Joe, is Cotswold District Council recycling material sent overseas, or is it rec recycled locally? If overseas, are we sure it is properly processed? Andy, we could probably do a whole show about this, <laughs> couldn't we? But in, you know, in just a quick 30 seconds to a minute, do you want to answer that? Um, OK, so my normal answer to this is to have a think about um, what will get used where. My usual classic example, for example, is how much red wine does the UK produce? Famously, not a lot. So where's your green glass going to go? Your green glass is going to go somewhere where it can be used more appropriately. So recycling overseas is not a net bad. What we're trying very hard to do, and it's one of the reasons we have the system that we do, is to have good quality recycling. Most of the horror stories you see, particularly in Southeast Asia, are container loads of what is effectively crap. It's all stuff mixed together, it's not sorted, it's just a mess. So one of the things that we aim to do by having a service that's got a very high degree of separation of materials is that those actually then have a value. They're useful to people who can reprocess them, they will take them, they will do something with them. Now, some materials are worth less than others. Cardboard, you're generally paying people to take away, but at least if you have good quality cardboard, that can be reused and it can go into other products and other items that come back to you again. So that's the key message I take away with it, is we try and get those materials to go to the right places so they're reused and they don't end up as waste. They become recycling, they can be reused. Okay, um, we've, had a, we've got a couple of questions filtering through that aren't specifically about garden waste. So I'll take a couple of those. We've had one from Melanie Butler. Um, why are there still um, homeless people on the streets in Sirencester? Melanie, it's a really, it's a really good question and something that I certainly ask our council officers. The key thing to say is every person who's sleeping rough that we know about has been offered um, accommodation. Uh, and as I understand it, um, the people in Sirencester at the minute have been offered, a, offered accommodation. Unfortunately, um, they don't have to choose to accept that accommodation and we can't force people um, to take it. So it's really, it is really, really difficult. Um, you know, you walk past people, you think, you know, would you really prefer to be on the street? Obviously, um, Obviously, we want to ensure that nobody is on the street, but quite often there are complex mental health problems, substance abuse issues that also require um, attention. So I think 
you know, you have it from our, you have it from me on behalf of the administration at the district council. We want to ensure that all homeless people have the support that they need, um, you know, to restart their life, get back in accommodation. But at the minute, we can't force people um, into um, accommodation that they don't want to go to. But um, it's something that our administration are committed to working towards over the next um, over the next months um, and years. So um, thanks for the question, um, Melanie. Um, Right, we have got... Can I use an incinerator to burn my garden waste? Andy? It's from Rick Harding. Um, so at the minute, we're recommending that you don't, um, and that's mostly because there's so many of us in close proximity. Like all things, though, they can be kind of shades of grey and that. If you are literally in the middle of nowhere and you have no neighbours, yeah, then you're unlikely to be causing disturbance to people. What does tend to be a problem is that even with the best intent in the world, you're going to get some smoke being generated. People are outside more. They're exposed to that. COVID is a respiratory illness, so that's also a concern in terms of what's going on at the minute. So we're asking people to try and avoid doing that to the maximum extent possible. Bear in mind some of the stuff that Daisy was talking about in her video. One of the very common things people do wrong with compost is have too much green stuff in there. So quite often some of that drier, crunchier material, you could do with that in your compost heap anyway to actually keep the air in and help it compost better. Okay. We're coming to the end of proceedings now, but before we go, um, we're going to we're going to hear from a pre-recorded interview I did earlier with Paul Robertson and his wife Leonie. Both are employees of Cotswold District Council, and their family have been doing something very special um, to fundraise for a local charity. Thomas, who are we doing this for? Doctors and nurses. So that was day five of the thirteen forty days for the NHS. Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas and I'm six. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Iris and I'm four. <laughs> so what do we want to say to the doctors and nurses? Absolutely delighted to say we're joined by some very special visitors um, this afternoon. Um, Paul and Leonie Robertson are both employees of CDC, and over the past few months, they've been up to something very special. Paul, Leonie, what have you been doing over the last month or so? So when lockdown started, um, we had these two little nippers coming out of school. Uh, we were very keen to keep doing PE with them, so we started with Joe Wicks. We started running a mile every day. Um, Thomas does that at Siddington <laughs> anyway. Um, so we decided that we would continue that. And then these two little bambinos come up with the idea of running 30 miles in 30 days. And who did we decide we were going to do it for, Thomas? Don't and everyone else that helps us. You're mad. <laughs> now, the nurses and anybody, key workers that help us. Fantastic. And guys, how much money have you raised? Oh, mummy. Over 4,500. Wow, that is seriously impressive. Um, I think we've got some footage um, which we will sort of run over, run over the it interview, you guys in action. You've had an amazing response, haven't you? Because it sort of went on to, I think BBC Gloucestershire covered it, didn't you? And then you got loads of, loads of coverage. I think it went viral, didn't it? It did, yeah. Um, so... We did two interviews with BBC Radio Gloucestershire, uh, two radio interviews with the Heart Network for the South West. Um, the Pride of Britain Awards. Pride of Britain Awards uh, yeah. put these two on their Facebook feed and uh, the Standard as well. So they were on the front page of the Wilson Gloss Standard. Fantastic. And you've had some pretty amazing um, amazing outfits. So tell us, tell us who you sort of dressed up as over the past few weeks. Um, well, Iris is a bit of a um, collector of outfits, so she has quite a few any, anyway, so lots of different Disney princesses. Um, Thomas, not so much, because he's not, wasn't really one for dressing up, but you've got more along, haven't you? Thomas loves his Star Wars, so 
You went out as Kylo Ren, didn't you? Fantastic. You loved Lego, so you went as a Lego man one day. Um, I said, I, I have a Ninjago Ninja Kai. Yeah, a wow. Ninjago Ninja. And Iris is pulling faces. <laughs> um, <laughs> the best part about it with the uh, fancy dresses is we had a lady called Davina. She made them some superhero capes for them to run around in. And Mummy was quite creative and we couldn't find an R2-D2 outfit for Iris. So Mummy made one. Wow, fantastic. So Leonie, R2-D2. what's it been- Leonie, what's it been like for you, you know, sort of living with this madness? It must have, it must have been amazing. Um, well, I've had to kind of do all the behind-the-scenes stuff, so getting the kids ready every day and, and then going out on my bike and filming them and trying not to get hit off my bike whilst trying to make sure I get some good footage of the kids. Um, and also kind of keeping an eye on the money side of things and collecting in sponsorship and things like that. So it's it's been quite hard work, but all worth it. The hard bit with the collection of money is it's been a lot of cash donations. So we've been having to transfer it from our account and then try and get to the nearest nationwide that's open to bank it. Of that's course, yeah. So Leon's done well with admin on that. Fantastic. Tool. Well, guys, well done to all of you. You know, you're both still working. You know, I imagine you're trying to do some homeschooling as well, trying to get some of that in. I imagine it's, I imagine you've been bloody knackered. So well done to you. Right. We've just finished doing maths so that we could talk to you, haven't we? And we're going back to doing maths. And then we've got a bit of daddy's home economics today. We're going to make a fudge cake. Oh, fantastic. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Well done. It's an amazing, amazing achievement. And I know everybody at the District Council is really, really proud. Thanks very much for joining us, all right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. I love the faces that those children were uh, were pulling. And I can tell you, we have our virtual council meetings and sometimes... I do worry about the conduct of some of our uh, some of our members because it's not it's not dissimilar to that. But uh, never mind. That's um, all for today, folks. Um, I just want to finish by saying thank you to all residents who have been so patient over the past couple of months. It's been a really really difficult time, and further challenges um, remain. The Garden Waste Service will resume from Wednesday, the thirteenth of May next week. Uh, that's not to say that every house is going to be collected on Wednesday. It will be staggered. So please do check out the Cotswold District Council website um, for details on that. But from next week, garden waste service will resume. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Thank you to everybody who's doing everything that they can to ensure that we protect the NHS, we save lives. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week. I hope you enjoyed today's show. To support our programme, and all the other fantastic programmes and content that the Barn Theatre produce, please consider making a donation by clicking the link below. In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. 
The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.